Okay, last time we added data structures to our language with the unit value, pairs, um, variance, and showed how with the desugar we can get um, uh, we can get objects and things like that. Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to add a new feature. Um, we're going to add mutation to our language. And in particular, we're going to add data structure mutation. Now, what is mutation? When we say mutation, we mean how um, in programming languages, uh, variables truly vary uh, over time and may change their value behind the scenes. So what do I mean by that? Suppose that we are writing in math, and I write the following. I say something like x is equal to f of 3, and y is equal to f of 3, and then I ask you the question, is x equal to y? You'll know that no matter what, the answer is yes. Because in math, f of 3 is always the same as every other call to f of 3. In contrast, suppose that I wrote in JavaScript, and I wrote x equals f of 3, and then I wrote y equals f of 3, and then I did something like if x equals y, sorry, if x doesn't equal y, then, you know, throw an error. Is it possible for this error to be thrown? And of course it is possible, because I could write the following function for x. I could say that f is equal to a function. Hmm, what's the right way to write this? The best way to do this. Oh, okay, here. Here's what we'll do. We could say let z equal zero, a function that takes in one argument. Uh, let's call it a. And what we'll do is we'll say z plus plus return a plus z. In this case, it's going to return 3 and then 4, or it's going to return 4 and then 5. Okay, so JavaScript is very different than math, and obviously this thing that we're doing in JavaScript would be powerful to write in Python and C and so on. Okay, so so far We've always tried to write, uh, all our languages have really just been ways of writing down math. Writing down math in different forms and different convenient ways. But at this point, we really want to deviate from math. Because in math, it's not possible to do things like this. So we have to have some other way of doing it. Here's the essence of the idea. The essence of the idea is that in the math, we're going to make it so that Rather than writing x equals f of 3, instead we're going to say that something that we're going to call sigma 1 is going to equal, so sigma 1 and x is going to equal calling f with sigma 0. And then sigma 2 and y is going to equal f of sigma 1 and 3. And now when we look at x, and why, it's possible for them to not be the same because notice that here we got sigma zero and there we got sigma one. This extra thing, this sigma, is called the store. And what the store does is it records all of the changes to memory that might have happened while a program was running. Now, one thing that's really important to notice about this is that it makes it considerably more complicated to analyze your program and understand what's going on. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that suppose you wrote a program that was like this, A plus B, a very simple program. And you want to know, what is this program equal to? If it is math, what I can do is I can take A, and I can send that over to the Ukraine, 
and say, will you please look at this program and tell me what it means? And then I can take B and send that over to Japan and say, will you look at this program and tell me what it means? And then they come back and they say, aha, A means three. And B, they come over here and they say, aha, B, that means three also. And then I would then conclude, aha, that means the whole thing is six. That's the way that math works. However, once we have mutation like this, this is no longer possible to do. The reason it's no longer possible is that evaluating B depends on what the answer from A is. Because A no longer, A reads sigma zero and produces sigma one, and B reads sigma one and produces sigma two. So therefore, the only way to understand what B does is if you already know what the Ukraine, what the Ukraine has told you A means. So what that means is that programs that use mutation are inherently non-parallelizable. You cannot analyze them or run them in parallel. They are also, this is also called non-compositionality. It used to be, if you had some big giant program with many different tasks, and I'm here I'm drawing a little tree of all the different things going on in the program. If you had a program like this that had all these different pieces, it would be possible for you to have different people working on each little part, and you could evaluate the program in one, two, three, four, five steps. The reason you could do it in five steps is you could have five people working on it simultaneously. Well, what you do is you have, I guess you could do it more, so, what, yeah, okay, so sorry. <laughs> so what you do is you have one, two, three, four, five, six people working on these things, and then they report their answers back. And then these two answers, someone works on this answer and that answer, and then someone works on this answer and this answer, and then someone works on that answer. And so all together it took you one step for those, two step for these two, three, four, five steps. So it took us at five steps because we can maximally parallelize it. In contrast, if you have mutation, then evaluating this part right here could change what this one does. So what that means is that the only way to evaluate this program is to take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven steps. So we take eleven steps to do that because we gotta do them all exactly in the right order. And we have to share the answers from one to another. So mutation is kind of a dangerous thing to add to your program because it makes things more complicated. It makes it more complicated to track what's going on. All right, that's enough preaching for now. Let's talk about how to actually add the features to our language. <coughs> what we're going to do is we're going to add, we're going to go from J5, I think J5, yep, we're going to go from J5 to J6, right? And we're going to add to our language the following things. We're going to change our set of values to hold a new kind of thing called a little sigma. We're going to change our expressions to have three more things. Box E, unbox E, and set box E. -E. Okay, and here are the rules. We're going to change our small step semantics so that it always has a parameter called sigma. So we're saying given a particular sigma and on a context where we have box v, then what we want to do is we want to turn this into a new sigma where we've extended a mapping from little sigma to v, and we're going to return little sigma out where little sigma is not inside of big sigma. The idea here is that little sigma is like a pointer. It's like an address inside of this mapping that records the contents of the boxes. A box is like a single pointer value. It's like something in memory that can be modified that has one particular spot in it. Okay, then what unbox does, so unbox, when it's called with a sigma, it's going to return looking up inside of sigma the value of that pointer. 
Okay. Then when we call setbox, it will be called with a pointer and a value. And what we're going to do is we're going to modify sigma so that the pointer is now pointing at that value and will be like C and will return the value that it was pointing at. Okay? <clears throat> so these three new features, first there's a way to create a box, then there's a way to read the box, and then there's a way to modify it. The small step semantics always takes as an additional parameter the incoming mapping and always returns a potentially updated mapping. Let's look at some example programs that use this. So I could write a program like this. Let f equal let b equal box 0 inside of lambda n. Then what I'll do is I will um, say set box b equal to add 1 unbox b. And then after that, I will return add 1 sorry, add n and unbox b. Then notice that, I, oh sorry, and then I'll put this inside of a use of minus f of 3, f of 3. This is kind of like the, uh, the example program that we wrote before. Okay, now notice that I have this little semicolon here, what does that mean? So if I have x semicolon y, that's going to be equal to, and you're going to put this in your disugarer, that's going to be equal to let blank equals x in y. All it does is it runs x, ignores the value, and then goes to the next thing. OK. <clears throat> so what happens when we run this program? So let's step through every little part of it. So when we run the program, we're going to evaluate this part right here. So we're going to get so we're going to get let f equal lambda n. Then it's going to say set box. And then there's going to be a pointer. Let's call it pointer 0. By the way, we start off with sigma being nothing. And then we're going to have sigma containing a mapping from pointer 0 to 0. And then we're going to have setbox pointer 0 to plus 1 unbox pointer 0, semicolon, plus n unbox pointer 0, inside of minus f3, f3. Okay, so that's the first step. So in the next step of the program, we're going to call f once on 3. So what that's going to do is we're going to subtract set box of sigma 1 plus unbox sigma 0 plus n unbox sigma 0 and we're going to subtract that from f of 3 and sigma still has sigma 0 going to 0. Okay, so then what happens next? Then we unbox it and get a 0 there, add 1, install that there, so we get minus, sorry, we gotta, gotta write the sigma first. So we get sigma 0 now being equal to 1, and then we have minus plus n unbox sigma 0 f3. Okay. 
And of course, n actually has already been substituted for 3, so I should have wrote that differently there. That should be 3. Okay, so then we're going to unbox and read that 1, get 4. So then we're going to get to sigma 0 being 1. And we're going to have the program be minus 4 f3. Okay. So then we repeat this. So then we're going to get sigma being sigma 0 going to 2. Then we're going to have minus 4 and plus 3 unbox sigma 0. That is going to turn into 2. Then we're going to get to sigma 0 minus 2, sorry, goes to 2 being minus 4, 5, which is going to get the final answer of negative 1. And as we can see, what the store does is it records all of the changes to the variables as we go on, not the variables, the boxes. Let's think about how we could implement this um, inside of our language. Sorry, inside of your implementation. So the easiest way to implement this is to the easiest way to implement this is to just add a new kind of value um, is to just have a new kind of value where um, that's just called a new, a boxed value. And, um, and have your code, like when you call the box function, like in C, let's call it make box to make it clear that we're talking about a C program, it's going to get a pointer to some object, some object O. And all you'll do is what you'll do is you'll, um, you'll malloc some space, right? We'll call it, you know, B star. Is going to be some space. Then we'll say that b, the object, is equal to o, and then we'll return, we'll return that thing, and then box unbox. All it's going to do is it's going to do b arrow o and return that, and then box set box takes the box value and the value, and it's just going to do b arrow o equal v. Okay, so the idea is, is that you just make it so that your CEK machine just has its own independent, um, it just has its own independent box value so that it knows at the C level. So there what you're doing is you're making it so that C's implementation of um, boxes, sorry, of mutation and pointers just becomes your implementation as well. That's probably the easiest way to do it. The other thing that you can do is you can explicitly change your machine so that your machine keeps track of a store. So here what you would do is you would go from the CEK3 machine to what's called the CESK machine. And the CESK machine basically looks like this. Your state is an expression, an environment, a store, and the continuation. And it has rules like the following, where... Um, when you reach a false and you have some environment and you have some store and you have a k if where you've saved an old environment, environment prime, and you have the true branch and the false branch and the continuation, then what you do is you switch to the false code. You have the restored saved environment and now you keep the store the same and then you pop off that continuation frame. So the idea is, is that the environments are lexically scoped, but the stores are these global variables that are constantly changed. Now this is definitely the best way to do things in theory, but in practice it's not really worth doing that because you're probably going to be implementing it in a language that already has mutation anyways. Now there's a few other design questions that you can have once we add mutation to our language. So, for example, once we have mutation, should we make it so that pairs 
can be modified. So for example, you know, we know that in our language, we have the pair value, right? So here's what we should do. Should we put in, should we add an operation called set first? And what it's going to do is it's going to take a pair of an A and a B. Let me just write it like this. So it's going to take a pair of an A and a B, and then it's going to also take in an A, and then it's going to change that to be something new. Should we add that operation and thus make it so that all data structures can now be mutated? You could do that, and that's kind of what languages like C and Java do. Everything by default is automatically mutable. Another thing you could do, and this is what languages like Racket, Haskell, and ML do, is they make it so you have to explicitly opt in to mutation. You have to explicitly use a box when you want something to be changed. In that case, what you could do, what a user could do is they could write a function like mpair, and what mpair would do is it would take a and b, and it would just call pair on a box of a and a box of b. And then you would have a function like mpair first, and what it would do is it would call unbox on the first thing inside of p. And you would have a function like mpair first set that would take an mpair and a value. And what it would do is it would call setbox on the first thing inside of the mpair and the value. The idea here is, is that if we make it so that you have to explicitly opt in, you can always build as a library implementations that uh, make it set by default. That's always possible, but it's not possible if you have operations like set first to take away mutation. And as we saw, mutation is dangerous because it increases the complexity of your code and makes it so it's more difficult to analyze. So in general, the programming language community has realized that you would never want to take away the opportunity for programmers to express invariance. And one of the invariants that a programmer li might, like to, might, might like to express is that a value can never change. Now, there's a lot of interesting library functions that are useful with um, mutation. And these are things that you will probably want to add to your disugarer. So here are some examples. You'll want to add something called begin to your disugarer, where if you write begin by itself, then it's going to turn into unit. And if you write begin e, then it's going to turn into the e. And if you write begin e1, e2, dot, 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 then you're going to turn that into e1, the colon, that's that sequence thing that I talked about before, and then another begin of e2, dot, dot, dot. So this allows you to write down a, a sequence of things all together at one level of indentation. Another thing that's useful is an operation called begin0. And so the way that begin0 works, if you write begin0, e0, e1, dot, 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 then that's going to be the same, sorry, begin 0, that's going to be the same as writing let answer equal e0 in begin e1, dot, 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 answer. So the idea with begin 0 is that you evaluate e0 first and its effect first, but then make it so that that is the answer after the, all the other things happen. You can also write things like when. So when condition code will be turned into if the condition is true, then do a begin with eb dot 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 otherwise do unit, which is like void, remember. You can add unless C E B dot dot dot, which gets turned into when not C E B dot dot dot. 
Okay. You could write a while loop. So a while loop where we have a condition and then some code, we're going to turn that into the following. We're going to turn it into um, a lambda that takes no arguments. And what it does is it says when the condition is true, then we're going to do eb dot dot dot, and then we're going to call rec again, and then we're going to call that right away. Okay, so that's, that's a while loop. We can implement for, which has a variable, an initial value, um, a, uh, let's call this a init, an increment. So let's do it like this. A limit and an increment. And we'll put those all inside of something and then we'll have the body. We can turn that into a while loop where we say while x is less than the limit. What we'll do is we'll do the body and then afterwards we'll say set box. Ooh, whoops. We're going to say let x equal box of init, and then this right here has to say unbox. Then we have to say set box x. Actually, sorry, let me fix this. I'm trying to cram stuff in. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say let x be equal box init in while less than unbox xb limit and then inside of the bot inside of the well we'll have a let x equals unbox xb inside of eb dot 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 and then afterwards we'll say set box xb equal to unbox xb plus the increment. And then we'll, and then we're done. That's what's inside of the while. Okay, so now we can have while loops, for loops, whens, ifs, and lesses, all sorts of things to make it so our language feels more like perhaps, you know, the C programming that you're used to. Of course, now we still only have um, mutation of data structures, that is, mutation of uh, these boxes. What we'll do next time is we'll extend this to have um, to we'll extend this to have variables like traditional languages like C and whatnot. So, see you next time.